<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Come on in. Nice to see people. We finally have a gorgeous day, although it's a little chilly out there, right? Perfect. Um, Steve, can I tell people what just happened to you? <laughs> or do you want to tell them? <laughs> yes, you tell them. I'm Steve was worried he wouldn't show up today because he just got caught in quicksand up to his knees. So uh, out on a walk. <laughs> and that happened to me recently out at the community gardens where I stepped in a in some mud and my shoe just like got sucked off. Um, so, but I guess Steve was stuck in the quicksand a few minutes ago. Well, so. it's just real bad mud. And, you know, I've always wanted a dog. I think I've had one or two that would help me in those situations. I'll tell you what, this guy just kept going, snipping around, being on trees, could care less that I might be dying. He didn't rescue you? <laughs> Not at all. He wasn't at all concerned about your well-being? I uh, didn't seem to care. It was like... I'm, his name is Little Bear. I said, Little Bear, I might be dying. Is there anything you could do? And he just goes around peeing on bushes. <laughs> that reminds me of um, when I first moved to Western Mass, I lived in a farmhouse in South Hadley, <laughs> old farmhouse. And I had my dog with me from LA, Bernie, who's a little American Eskimo dog, um, who was very loyal, but also pretty neurotic and and narcissistic. <laughs> so there was a day where I was going down my cellar stairs, eating a muffin, and I was distracted and I slipped and fell all the way down the cellar stairs to the bottom on a cement floor. And luckily I was only 25, so I was okay. But, um, but you know, my dog was at the top of the stairs and he looked down and he saw me and he came running down the stairs after me. And I thought, oh, Bernie cares. He cares about, you know, he's coming to see if I'm okay. But no, he saw the muffin fly out of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and that was all he wanted was the he grabbed the muffin and he ran back up the stairs with the muffin and left me on the cellar floor. <laughs> no Sometimes they're, you know, your best friend, but. <laughs> yeah, if you don't ask too much of them. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. It's great to see some familiar faces and some that I don't know. So welcome um, to our reading, Writers in Progress, hosting a reading uh, for Steve Bernstein. We're super excited to celebrate um, the launch of his book, which we'll get into in a minute. We're gonna just give people a few more minutes to arrive. Uh, if you wanna grab a snack or something to drink, um, we're probably gonna start in about two or three minutes. I have my kombucha here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been sipping too much wine lately, so tonight it's kombucha. Um, but if you want to grab something, feel free to do get cozy and get what you need. And we're going to start in just a minute. Looks like we have people from all over the place oh. here, right? I know. I was just saying, like, it would be so fun to do this in person, right? And have yeah. one of those festive gatherings. But um, then so many of you who I see from far away, I wouldn't be able to join us. Uh, like you, Carla, and you, Jeannie. So welcome. Hi, Jacqueline. Good to see you. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna get started here momentarily. Emily. Hi, Jeannie. What else do we have here, Todd, David? Okay. How many of you are here um, as part of our writing community? Just raise your hands. Awesome. And then I'm guessing the rest are here for 
Steve, maybe we can rope you into our writing community though. <laughs> um, so we're here to celebrate Steve Bernstein's story from the stoop. This is the beautiful book, hardback, my, my new copy from Simon & Schuster's Sky Horse Press that just came out and arrived in my mailbox on my birthday. It, the book and I share a birthday, which is kind of fun. Um, so we're going to do a little reading from Steve. And then at the end of Steve's reading, we'll have um, just a conversation about Steve's path as a writer, his journey in life and towards this book and what he's working on now and what his process has been um, getting this far. It's a big deal to get a book published um, by a traditional publisher these days. It's not an easy feat. <laughs> so it's um, it's definitely celebratory. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Um, I think it was about um, eight years ago, nine years ago, right? And for those of you who don't know our community, um, this is Writers in Progress. Uh, we are a writing studio in the, the town of Northampton, Florence, which is in Western Massachusetts. And uh, we run Writers in Progress out of an old uh, industrial arts building, a converted mill building that's been made into really cool art studios. So we have a great studio there. Um, and through that studio and also now online, thanks to the pandemic, we have um, a bunch of different writing groups that are running weekly, that are running for one day or half day events. Um, and you can check us out here. Let me just type it in the chat bar. If you wanna see what we're up to, uh, it's writersinprogress.com. Every season we offer about um, a dozen or so workshops by different writers, um, they used to be regional writers, but now they're really, um, again, because of Zoom all, from all over the place. And uh, we have offerings on craft, offerings on the process of writing. Um, coming up, we have a couple of great weekly things that I'll touch on at the end that you might be interested in. Um, but it was, it, it was back in, I don't know, 2014, 2015, when I got a phone call and we weren't anywhere online. I'd never heard of Zoom. Let me just say something right here. Yeah. This is not it, but this is the size of it that was in the back of the newspaper that I cut out this ad and magneted it. Is that a verb? Magneted it to my freezer door. And I just let it sit there for a while. And what does the ad say, Steve? Would you read it? Oh, this this is not yours, Dora. Oh, that's not it. Okay. This is one call does it all picks up. <laughs> okay. Well, you know that could be my ad. I don't know. <laughs> it's I don't remember what the ad said either, but um, it was around. I'll tell you, the ad said, uh, "Tell your story" or something like uh, that. Join our group. Write your story. Uh, writers in progress. Call this number. Nothing fancy. Yeah. So I got a call and uh, on the other end of the line was Steve's voice with his fabulous Bronx accent saying, I'm not a writer. I'm a plumber. I'm a retiring plumber. I don't know anything about writing, but I got a lot of good stories that I want to tell. <laughs> so is this the right place for me? So Steve came um, about a month later to one of my weekly workshops and you know, there, there's so many wonderful writers that come through our our workshops. Um, this was a voice I hadn't heard before. It was, uh, Steve's was a really interesting voice in terms of both how his voice sounded, but, but also in terms of the stories that he was telling and the content. And it was like, wow. Um, and he seemed to have a really solid grasp on what those stories were. So, um, we're going to talk about more about his journey at the end of this reading, but to introduce him, I just want to say, you know, it's been such an incredible, satisfying thing 
to see you turn into a writer, Steve, you know, to go from that phone call saying, I'm not a writer, I'm just a plumber, I don't know what I'm doing, but I have some stories to tell to a mere, you know, eight or nine years later, having a book in print with a major publisher. It's not a, it's not a usual story. Um, it usually takes longer than that for someone to, to take that journey. Um, it's very inspiring and it's super exciting. Um, so congratulations. It's been such a pleasure. So here's my introduction for Steve. Most authors don't have a plumber's license and a master's degree, but Steve has both. As a kid, he survived the turbulent Bronx streets of the 1960s and a lot of chaos at home. Since his early 20s, Steve has worked as a mentor, teacher, and an advocate for teens in trouble. He's also a, a humane educator and animal rights activist who shares his home in Western Mass with his non-human companion, Little Bear, who failed to save him from the mud today. <laughs> so welcome, Steve. Um, Steve is going to share a couple of short pieces from his work. And afterwards, we're going to have a conversation uh, about his process and his journey. So during the reading, if you have any questions that you want to ask, um, type them in the chat bar. And we'll make sure that we get to you at the end of the reading. Steve, it's all yours. Thank you, Dory. Um, and I, I also want to say it, it was eight years ago that I walked into your studio, uh, a plumber who didn't know how to write but had a lot of stories. But the truth is going to your groups and hearing from the fabulous writers that you attract at Writers in Progress, it really only took one to two years for me to write my book, do your manuscript program, mm -hmm. uh, and then learn about Amazon. And I have fabulous, very close people uh, who help with the editing and get me ready for Amazon. So really the whole process, I think if we didn't have COVID, mm -hmm. which is what stalled it to this time, would have taken less than four years. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty incredible. Um, uh, to me, because, and, I, and I'll talk more about my journey later, I'm sure, but it really, uh, it really amazed me that there's this thing called Amazon, which I know all about, originally a bookseller, and um, I just decided to use it. It wasn't no grand scheme of mainstream publishing. I just was going to use what I had in, in this world without a whole bunch of you know, outreach and research. The truth is I tried a couple of times and I realized conventional agents was not for me. Aside from some of the crazy cockamamie stuff they do, I'm just not a guy who likes to handle rejection, to be honest with you. So I had a feeling that's what I was setting myself up for. So I just thought, you know, I buy all my stuff on Amazon. I could put my book on Amazon, see what happens. Hmm. So I want to read... Uh, one page from my book. This is my new book. This is my old book. I know, you know, they didn't change much. I'll be honest with you. I hope my favorite, famous, best friend uh, editor is in the audience because as far as editing goes, it was just real. There was a lot of revision, but I wouldn't call that editing per se. But the editing that my friend, best friend Judy helped me with is about and maybe I'm off, but there was about 40 or 50 reallys, just really, really this and really that. Just she talk, uh, got in touch one day and said, you really need all these? So between that and then getting to the real publisher, they kept commenting that your grammar is all wrong, but I see we're going to leave it because it's your voice. But what they took out was about 50 commas. So that, you know, that's kind of unheard of because I think it was you, Dory, who told me how they kind of butchered your book, uh, in a sense. Um, but I wasn't going to have that anyway. So I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction of this book. It was 1994. I was 40. And after more than 20 years as a plumber, I decided to get my bachelor's and then my master's degree. I found myself in a 
course called Storytelling at Antioch University in Keene, New Hampshire. I was with a dozen students, all half my age. In the first few minutes on the first day of class, each student was asked to describe how they would use storytelling in their environmental work. This is an environmental program. One after another, they each explained how they hoped to incorporate stories from indigenous cultures from around the world. That just wasn't me. It didn't feel genuine. Who was I to tell other people's stories? I had my own indigenous stories from the streets in the Bronx where I grew up. So I asked the professor, is it okay if I just tell my own story? And that's when the story Wolf, which I'll read you a little piece of today, was born. For the next 20 years, it was a story I told to at-risk teens in my work as a mentor, humane educator, and special education teacher. When I told the story of me and Wolf, the barriers between me and the teens disappeared. The magic of me telling my story gave them permission to tell theirs. And like me, they had tough stories of their own bottled up that needed to be told, that needed to be heard. In 2017, Wolf became the first of seven stories in this memoir about growing up in the Bronx in the 60s and 70s. I hope these adventure stories of a tough time, a tough place, but always hopeful and often fun, will inspire you to tell your own stories. When you do, let me know. I want to hear them. To me, stories are everything. And I just read that like for the first time because it's not in my old book. And I said, you know, that might be a nice thing to read today. So I've got two stories, very, very small excerpts. They're, they're stories I extracted from my book because I was doing story slams. You get, it's torture, to be honest with you. You got to get it memorized. It's got to be true. You get five minutes. So I, I took a few of my stories that are very emblematic of my life and my journey in this world in general, not just as a writer, and I condensed them into five-minute slams, and they're, they're very good on their own. I'm, you know, the, the other stories are 15, 20, and 30 pages, but this is just 500 words or so. And so we have a story about my dog, Wolf, and we have a story about basketball. I am, sort of, I am going to choose Wolf first. Steve, last night the junkies broke in again. This time, they smashed the front window and took the rest of my plumbing tools. So take a look, son. That, my boy, is Wolf. Now it's his job to watch the shop at night and your job to take care of him. My old man pointed to the shattered front window of his plumbing shop. A giant wolf-type dog lay stretched out over the entire shelf on the other side of the broken window. Wolf lifted his head, the size of a gallon milk jug, his mouth hung open and his eyes, one blue, one brown, invited me to come closer. I reached out my hand and smoothed the thick fur on top of his head. He closed his eyes and leaned his massive head into my hand. I gave his neck and shoulders a good rub down. He fell asleep. That's how our friendship began. It was June 1968 in the South Bronx and I had just graduated junior high school, PS 82. Every morning I'd come downstairs from my apartment and head next door to the shop. I'd wake Wolf up with a, come on boy, let's go. Jangle his heavy chain leash and we'd hit the streets. We hit the bodega for a soda for me and to the butcher shop for bones for Wolf. For once, tough guys kept their distance. From across the street, I'd hear, hey Steve, wanna fight my Doberman? Or nobody gonna mess with you now, bro. Before Wolf, they did mess with me. I was the wrong color. With Wolf by my side, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't alone. That summer, me and Wolf fell in love. At the end of August, I was shooting hoops at the PS90 schoolyard when a kid came running onto the court yelling, yo, Steve, they beating up your brother. I sprinted to two blocks home. A kid was shoving my brother against your building, trying to take against our building, trying to take his money. I pushed the kid away, pushed him hard. He fell over backwards, hitting his face on the stoop. Through tears and bloody snot, he looked up at me. My big brother and his boys are gonna get you. I told my brother, go get dad. I knew he was sleeping off a drunk, but at least that got my brother off the street. Alone, sitting on my stoop, my head in my hands, I was terrified. Nobody was gonna help me. 
I glanced over to the plumbing shop where Wolf was snoozing on his shelf. Wolf was my plan. Wolf was all I had. Come on, boy, let's go. He yawned, hopped off the shelf, and stretched out to his full six-foot length. I clipped on his chain, leash, and together, we walked back to the stoop to wait. I wrapped Wolf's leash twice tight around my fist, pulling his leash up close to me so he'd look ferocious, his tongue hanging out the side of his mouth his teeth in a snarl, his mismatched eyes bulging out of his huge head. I was damn near strangling him. I hated doing it, but I didn't think I had a choice. Together we waited. The gang turned the corner, some holding baseball bats. One look at Wolf and they kept their distance. The big brother planted himself three feet in front of me. Why'd you do that to my little brother for? You so much older and bigger. I didn't mean to hurt him. I'm 14, your brother's 16. He was going after my little brother. I had to do something. The brother kept both eyes on Wolf, who was still snarling and straining against his leash. Someday you ain't going to have that mutt with you. You better watch for me on every corner. I'm going to get you, man. The brother and his gang walked away. Before he got to the corner, he stopped and looked back. For a moment, our eyes locked. That's when I knew he wasn't going to get me. Like me, he was a big brother. He understood. That September, I started high school. Me and Wolf couldn't spend as much time together, but every night we hung out. One evening, I went to the plumbing shop to catch up with Wolf, give him a bone and a romp around the block, and then tuck him in for the night. Outside the shop, Jimmy, the scumbag who worked for my old man, stood leaning against the storefront, drinking a Colt 45 out of a paper bag, his cigarette hanging off the side of his mouth. He sneered at me as usual, showing his rotten brown teeth. I looked around inside the shop. My old man was on the cot, snoring an empty bottle of scotch dangling from his hand. Wolf's bowls and leash were on the floor. No wolf. I screamed at Jimmy, where's Wolf? What did you do with him? Jimmy smirked. No, nah, man, it wasn't me. No, it was your daddy. He got good and drunk and he lost your dog in a poker game. It felt like a kick to the gut. I couldn't breathe. Gulping for air, I raced up and down the streets, searching in alleys, basements, the schoolyard. No wolf. I walked back to my stoop, up the eight flights of stairs to my dark apartment. I didn't cry. I do now. Mm. Shall I continue? Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was amazing. That's a, uh, I, I call it my my signature story because it made me grow up and accept things out of my control. And it also established my love for animals more than anything. And from what I understand, it was also the story, the first story, first that, story. that you told, right? It was pretty much the only story I had uh, because it was a, you know, it really worked with kids. There's such there's such a feeling of loss and 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 uh, being disempowered, mm -hmm. and every time they came through with stories about their pets, their mm -hmm. pets could be a rat, their mm -hmm. pets could be a uh, you know a chihuahua, mm -hmm. or some other animal that uh, turtles, birds, that they just went ahead and felt so, you know, permitted now to talk about their feelings for them. And there were times their pets were, you know, Rottweilers and uh, pit bulls that their dad or whatever other figures, male figures were, you know, keeping for dog fights or just status on the street. But the kids loved them. Mm -hmm. And so somehow this became so much more my story and then my story to share mostly with kids. Mm -hmm. And it still is to this day. So I, that's why, you know, everybody, every time I read, I do a reading and now this great thing today, I dig up Wolf. <laughs> it just, it just made me who I am in so many ways, as did this next story. This next story is called The Last Hustle, and it's a takeoff from chapter three in my book called Order on the Court. And it's a little snippet of that story and even a smaller snippet because I condensed it for the slam. But um, 
I think it stands alone and, and, and it's very timely as you'll understand why. August and the PS 104 schoolyard was empty, a good thing. Gave me a chance to develop my pitching arm and avoid trouble. As a white kid in the South Bronx in 1967, trouble had a way of finding me. I was bouncing a Spalding rubber ball off the side of the school building. Behind me, I heard a basketball bouncing at the other end of the schoolyard. I turned around and saw a tall, lanky kid, older than me for sure. I didn't know anything about basketball, but I knew he was practicing. The drill went like this, jump and shoot, dribble away from the hoop, jump and shoot, rebound, and finish up with a layup. He yelled over, so what do you think? Was this kid talking to me, a 12-year-old white kid? There was no one else around, so I yelled back, about what? Playing basketball. I never played basketball in my life. No problem, I'll teach you. The next four Sundays, me and Isaac met at the schoolyard. He taught me how to dribble and shoot, plus some cool plays like the baseline jumper, the alley-oop, and the no-look pass to the foul line. After a month, Isaac said, we're ready. For what? The hustle. This is how the hustle worked. We'd go to parks, schoolyards, wherever there was a court. Isaac went up to a couple guys hanging around the court and talked us up. He gestured over to me. The guys would snicker and eagerly cough up a few coins to lay the bet. The hustle, the hustle brought in real money, but it ended six months later in January when my family was forced to move to another neighborhood in the Bronx. In March, Isaac called to say, looks like I'm moving too, back to Delaware. Ma's asking about you. The kids miss you. She wants you to come for dinner. Then we're going to do the hustle one last time, you and me, my brother. It was a warm Thursday afternoon in early April when I walked the 15 blocks to Isaac's. Standing outside the apartment door, I could smell the pork chops. I knew there'd be collards and sweet potatoes waiting for me inside. I always liked going to Isaac's. I felt safe there with his family. Ma, the two dads, a little brother, two little sisters, and the baby. And sometimes me. I stayed there many nights, sometimes for weeks, sleeping on pillows and blankets on the floor in the kids' room. I slept better on that floor than at my apartment. In the morning, before I left for school, Ma would remind me, Steve, when things get too rough at your place, you are always welcome here, anytime. You understand me? After dinner, me and Isaac headed to the court a few blocks away at the Sedgwick Projects. Isaac found two guys who, after they took one look at me, eagerly placed a bet. Game on. Our plays were nothing short of perfection. We had them down 10-2, our point. I was taking the ball out at the foul line for the win. The transistor radio hanging off the chain link fence was playing My Girl by the Temptations. The song suddenly stopped. The announcer interrupted. The Reverend Martin Luther King was shot and killed today by a white man. As usual, I was the only white kid on the court. The other guys stopped. The court grew eerily silent. Shock and grief on their faces turned to rage. Isaac slowly walked toward me, took the ball out of my hand and laid it down on the cement. He hooked his elbow into mine and hustled me off the court. When we reached the overpass of the Cross Bronx Expressway, we heard the chant, Whitey killed the king, Whitey killed the king. Isaac started to sprint. He looked back at me screaming, Hurry up, Steve, hurry up. His face was wet with tears. We made it back to Isaac's, barging through the apartment door, panting, trying to catch our breath. The family was in the living room, all seven of them watching the news on a small black and white TV. Startled, they turned around and rushed towards us, hugging us, crying. A family embrace. We stood in a circle, quietly holding each other. Isaac announced, Ma, we're going to keep Steve here for a while till it's safe on the street for him to go home. One of the dads eased himself out of the circle and went over to the open apartment door. He shut the door and one at a time turned each of the three locks. Click, click, click. Hmm. 
Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. That was amazing. And for those of you who haven't read Steve's book yet, you really have to because those pieces were incredible, but the longer, the full version of each of them is even more amazing, <laughs> honestly. Um, it's so much fun to to hear the shortened version. I don't know how you did that so well, but uh, you know, in the longer version of the wolf story, we get, you know, the whole lead up to Wolf's disappearance, which involves a real, you know, life-threatening situation where Wolf saves Steve by just standing there, <laughs> you know, Steve trying to make him look tough, even though Wolf's not a tough dog at all, um, and saves him from getting beaten up. And then in that second story with Isaac, right, like the the, the story goes on from there, and it's also intertwined with the story about um, you know, doing your, your Hebrew school training, right? <laughs> Preparing for your bar mitzvah in the middle of this crazy neighborhood. And, um, and at the end of that piece, after the, um, the assassination of King, both kids move away, right? And Steve moves to, um, uh, a mostly white neighborhood. So that's, it's still in the Bronx though, right? Um, and then there's this amazing scene where Isaac comes to visit that neighborhood, right? And they try to do their same old basketball hustle, but, you know, being a black kid in that new neighborhood is is not the same. So I won't give it away, but it, it's a really amazing ending to that chapter. Um, just stunning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just ask you a couple more questions. You've talked already a little bit about your journey um, to being a writer. Do you feel like a writer yet, Steve? <laughs> wow. You know, every milestone helps me say, yeah, yeah I feel like a writer now. I, I said that in your group early on. In a way, I said, I got a book. I'm writing a book. I didn't know it for a year. And then uh, I said, I got a book. Didn't mean I was a writer though. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I've never taken a writing course, nor did I ever want to, to be honest with you. And so to feel like a writer took some mm -hmm. time and events. Mm -hmm. And the events unfolded for me more than me making them happen. Getting the book on Amazon was, I think I, that was the end of my journey. And if I, you know, it was fine. I was happy. I can go there anytime and look at all the, the comments, some of them quite good, a couple of stinkers, I'll admit. Uh, but basically um, it was enough for me. So you I, didn't feel, you didn't feel like, oh, I really want to pitch this to publishing houses. I want to get out there and and get no. a book contract. That was never sort of part of your plan. But you had some interesting experiences with agents. Do you mind sharing those with us? Yeah. And if anybody wants more detail, this is straight out of my head. It's on my website. Um, so I went to a writer's conference locally, or two, or three, I don't remember. And part of the writer's conference uh, workshops were you get to meet an agent if you, you know, make an appointment by you know, email earlier, you, they'll give you some time, 15 minutes. And um, so, of course, I, I, it was still, you know, on the horizon that maybe I want to do that. I got to learn more about it because not only did I know how to write or what I was doing, I didn't know anything about agents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my introduction. Uh, the first time in these two brief little stories, the first time was I and this is like an incredible, funny story. I get to my appointment. You know, I'm waiting out in the hallway. I get there. I sit down. And the lady is on the other side of the desk. And, you know, very nice. And uh, she starts asking me a bunch of questions, very simple questions that I addressed in my email. Like, you know, what's your book about? What's the name of your book? Where does it take place? What years? And I'm thinking, she knows all this or should. But I let it all go. I just let it go and, and hope we'd have a better conversation. Well, after that kind of introduction to each other, she gets a phone call, takes out her cell phone. 
She just goes like this, Hold, give me a minute, just give me a minute. She takes out her cell phone and she starts talking to some guy evidently on the other end of the phone. I'm listening to the conversation, goes, what else am I gonna do? And um, she starts uh, reacting to his, um, he, he's like in an emergency. And she kept saying, okay, tell me, tell me what's happening. The ceiling is caving in, water's pouring out. What, what do you think, what's going on? And you could hear the guy say, I don't know what's going on. And finally, after five minutes of that conversation, I've had enough because, you know, I'm a plumber. So I'm hearing water and ceilings and floods and, and somebody whimpering on the other end of the phone. So I go like this to the lady, please just hand me the phone. Hand me the phone. <laughs> now we're into a good 10, 12 minutes of my appointment. And I said, I forget the guy's name, Jim or something. I say, Jim, okay, tell me exactly what's happening. Okay, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to the basement. I want you to look for a little pipe, not a big pipe, a little pipe. And it has uh, what we call shut off valves on it. And it might be near this, this brass looking globular thing called the water meter. Are you down there? Yep, you see it? No, no, not that pipe, the other pipe. Oh, okay, Jim, good. Turn the handle, and then the water stops. I said, great, good job, Jim. I hear into the phone back. I got one minute left or I'm in the last minute. And she says, oh God, thank you so much. You saved, you saved me, you saved me so much money and hassle. Thank you, I, you uh, too bad our time is up. <laughs> but she said, I will call you. I definitely, I owe you. I will take care of you. Never heard from her. And that was your whole agent meeting. <laughs> so the second one, true story, is I go into, and there's some people maybe in the audience who remember this. I go into maybe another conference or the same one, I don't know, but there's a panel of agents where they're talking about their process of, uh, you know, accepting or declining work from, you know, really hungry authors. And it goes down the line, very nice people. They all had some compassion, except for one, in my opinion. This was a young woman who basically said, uh, her first sentence was, if you ever send me anything about a dog, I'm throwing it in the garbage. And I said, and we had signed up with little snippets to see if they'll accept our, our first line or a passage. And sure enough, mine was from the story Wolf. It was probably the best line in the whole story. And she looks at it and there's a pause, maybe a minute, she's looking at it because she read it out loud. The whole audience knew it was about a dog and they were probably chomping at the bit waiting to see what she was gonna do. And she said, I'd ask for more. <laughs> now that could be encouraging, but it was not because of the capricious and fickle nature of what she was demonstrating as to how, maybe not all agents, but it could, the process could be like that. I said, I'm done, <laughs> that's it, <laughs> I'm not doing this. So after that, you decided to self-publish on Amazon. Amazon looked good. And the book was up there for, uh, what, about a, about a year when you got- uh, I'd say a year and a half. A year and a half when you got an email from yeah. somebody. Simon and Schuster, do you want to tell us just briefly? Yeah, I got a lot of emails. When you just in case you guys want to do this, or I, I gotta write what's the right pronoun? People, in case you people want to do this. Um when you get on Amazon, you are actually getting out exposing yourself to the world, basically. Be ready in my at least for me, I got a whole crap load of correspondences guaranteeing. Traditional publishing, fine print at the bottom was always like for eighty five hundred dollars or ten grand or you know don't worry we, we could do payments or whatever, and so but this lady this woman uh, that's a good pronoun this woman sent me an guaranteeing email. guaranteeing traditional publishing if you pay eighty five hundred dollars <laughs> but they took payments so anyway she gets in touch and leaves an email and I see the heading of a, a real publishing company. It was called Skyhorse Publishing. And uh, her email was very professional and forthright and said, basically my boss, his name is Tony Lyons, 
uh, who owns the company, um, really liked your book. He got it on Amazon and liked your book, and he'd like to invite you down to talk about maybe you want to do mainstream publishing. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't see anything for $8,500 or any money. If anything, I think they even said in that first letter, we'll pay you. Wow. What a concept, so, huh? Uh, yeah, so um, I got in touch. A lovely woman, really, uh, so nice. So I, she's an editor, uh, was an editor. COVID kind of wiped out half the staff there as it did for everybody everywhere. But she uh, told me that she'd like to invite me down, talk about doing mainstream publishing with Skyhorse. And I looked Skyhorse up because I wasn't taking any chances, you know. Totally top shelf, legit, very renowned. I look at the books that they have. They have like 10 or 12 what they call imprints with different categories, depending, you know, self-help or youth or whatever. Uh, it just looks fabulous. And I don't know anything about publishing companies, but it looked so much like the real deal. And this woman in particular was so kind and smart and answered any question i said yeah <laughs> send me the address and give me an appointment and um i went down and my partner very smart lady very smart said to me don't go there without home-baked cookies <laughs> so she made up a batch of linzer cookies delicious by the way half of them went on the train down but i had enough left and um, and we she brought you know you walk in eleventh floor of this very narrow building uh, top floor on thirty sixth street or thirty seventh street and the, and the elevator opens up to this glass office and all you see are stacks and piles of books floor halfway up to the ceiling and then I walk around to the to the uh, conference room where I was being directed and I got a glimpse over the stacks. They were their cubicles. People were working in these stacked up book cubicles, editors going to town. And so uh, we had a lovely meeting. Tony wasn't there yet. He was coming from cross town. He gets there about 20 minutes later. He walks in. I'm having a nice talk with the people who, who work there. And um, he walks in the glassed in conference room. We're sitting at a long table and he just kind of nods over to me and he picks up my book. Swear to God, he goes like this. Yeah, I love this book. Now I want to tell you about my neighborhoods and the kids I grew up with and the games we played in the street. <laughs> and that took 20 minutes, half an hour. And he's eating cookies and they went totally gone by then. And uh, he said, yeah, take the contract home, look at it, think about it, call, ask questions. And I did. That's fantastic. What a great story. <laughs> did yeah. he leave you any of those cookies or were they gone by then? Oh, I, I don't <laughs> think I, I had one cookie, I think, on in the whole time. They were very good. And I, <laughs> I, I think, is it a big... Is it a big part of my success? It very well may be. But he actually said, I want a Bronx book in my house. I want a storybook from the Bronx. He was a New Yorker. He was from Manhattan. <clears throat> and that was okay. I cut him some slack. And we, we <laughs> wanted to, you know, have that in his house. And uh, he expressed that. Yeah. And, it, and, then, and then, of course, it was a month before COVID. And that shut down everything for years. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's no. been a little bit of a wait for this moment. Yeah, I stopped being so antsy. And, you know, in the beginning, I wasn't that hot on the idea. I just, it just fell in my lap, basically. But um, I just felt, let COVID come and go. Give them a call. They were swamped trying to get their stuff back together. And it took a year. Mm -hmm. After that. Till now. Great stories too. You, yeah, someone pointed out in the chat, Wendy did that your your oral storytelling is just as good as the written. <laughs> I get my audio. Oh, are you reading the audio? I it's me uh, narrating the, the oh, audio. That's fantastic. What a great uh, that's a great decision on their part. No, so I, I, I want I, I did it six years ago. Oh, and, I see. You wanted to pick it up. 
Yeah. I think it's better than reading my book. I, yeah, I, I love bet. It. Yeah. Well, it, hearing it in your voice, you know, is like yeah. really, it's it's part of the experience, I think. It's fantastic. You have a lot in your in your work about community. Um, you know, your narrator is an outsider in so many different situations, you know, an outsider with the black kids, an outsider with the white kids, an outsider with the Puerto Rican kids, even a white, uh, an outsider with the Jewish kids, you know, like it's really about a search for trying to find a tribe, trying to belong. But then there's also a lot about um, community and neighborhoods and you know, one of the things that really struck me was this description of when, you know, the narrator moves from a, a you know, a kind of a rougher neighborhood in the Bronx to a, a quote unquote nicer, which really meant whiter, right, neighborhood in the Bronx. There was something lost. There was something that he missed about that previous neighborhood that had to do with people being out on their stoops, right? And I love that the that the title is stories from the stoop. Can I just read this one paragraph from your book that that's about stoops? Cause I just think it's so beautiful. Um, it's, it's from Bronx boys, page 158. The buildings in the new neighborhood were small or single or attached homes and a few apartment buildings. Sure, these buildings might've had a few stairs out front but they weren't a real stoop. How do you know it's a, how you know it's a real stoop is not so much what it looks like, but rather what happens on it. A stoop is a place to socialize. People hanging out, reading the paper, playing dominoes or cards, talking and gossiping, smoking, eating a hero with the waxed paper laid on their lap, playing congas, shooting craps, listening to the radio, rocking babies to sleep, playing with the dog, braiding hair, drinking coffee, soda or beer and later in the evening, kissing, and sometimes a little bit more. People would bring out milk crates to sit on, folding chairs, card tables, and battery-operated portable record players. And if the Yankees were playing, the TV would come out too, attached by a series of extension cords threaded through a window. Stoop sitting included the mothers and the grandmothers who sat in a front window, a pillow on the window ledge under their elbows as they kept a close eye on the children playing in the street. I never saw anybody on the so-called stoops in the new neighborhood. I just thought that but, was so completely gorgeous. Let alone, they're not real stoops to begin with. Right. I mean, in a, in a structural sense. Right. Um, but you know, that was New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, other, other cities, East Coast, old cities. That was the thing for generations and generations. Mine was the generation where, shut up, sorry. The stoop, <laughs> the stoop got dangerous. Yeah. It got dangerous. Well, I love that. I love the whole idea of the stoop as community. You know, the stoop as private life happening in a public square kind of sense, you know, um, and I, I have one one other question, and then I want to go to other people's questions, which is about about our writing community, really, you know, because I think we're not sitting on stoops. We're not like rocking our babies on the stoops right now. You know, we've lost a big part of what that is with the pandemic, but there's still this impulse, right, that drives us together, that makes us want to tell our stories to one another, that makes us want to do this work in the company of other people um doing the work and hearing their stories and so I, I wondered if you could just speak for a minute about what the you know how the the process of being in a writing community and being in workshops has contributed to your journey uh do you guys want me to shoot my dog is it okay it's fine you hear him yeah please I, don't shoot him <laughs> well, okay that's figurative um the writing groups are my stoops now. It takes it takes me to a social place, an active place, a place where people are sharing stories. Of course, we're writers and we're writing stuff. 
and we're encouraging each other. But nonetheless, it's a great substitute at this point in my life because, you know, I got a kind of a stoop outside, but this is a suburban home and ain't nobody around. So the writing group has, has allowed me to, to, to be that free kid again, to be able to feel like I could tell you anything, and to be able to hear what you have to say. And I feel um, if there's any, this is the biggest gift and the biggest blessings I had was your little ad that I cut out and then a month later called you. That was my, my resurrection. Excuse me for one second, please. We can't really hear him in, in case you're wondering. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. <laughs> I'm going to move to questions here in a minute because there's a few I see in the chat bar. So, um, Jeannie, yours was the first. So when Steve comes back, I'm going to let you unmute and ask it yourself. Okay. Are you still around, Jeannie? Jeannie Barnett? No. She left. Oh. No, I'm here. Oh, for oh Jeannie, you don't understand me like that. <laughs> my no, internet is unstable, so I've got my video off. But okay. uh, why don't you go ahead and ask your questions, Jeannie? Oh, great. Okay, so I'm gonna just risk freezing here. Uh, I had to move to the other part of the house. Um, two, I'm so many questions, Steve. It's so inspiring. Uh, how did Tony find your book on Amazon? That's my first question, and then. Were you publishing excerpts elsewhere as you were, you, you had this compilation and there was, I'm sure, opportunities to publish in other, even yeah. literary journals. So how did you, how did you feel and approach that? Well, up at the top of my screen is a woman named Emily Lackey, who most of you probably know. She put together this fabulous program, this course, workshop, it was a one day, on submissions, how to submit, where to submit, how to create the, you know, the charts, and it was really beautiful. She has another one coming up this spring, so. Take it. Yeah. Don't do what I did, which is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a reason, I think, or reasons. And that is, aside from hearing about the legalities of, you know, when you have your stuff published here someplace, do they own it? What are the rights? And, you know, I, I didn't want to get into that. So I felt very uh, territorial and possessive about keeping my stuff the way it was. Uh, but I did, I did, I do put it up on my website, stuff that I write, and I, I'm willing to challenge whatever legalities there are with that. It's my website. Um, and I'm not even sure it's an issue, but I felt that um, most of my work is always in progress and I want to keep, you know, working it. I want to keep going back and revising. And so the place that a story can get called final, it's, it's quite a process of revision, which I think writers can relate to, that uh, revising and editing is, is is a big deal. So I don't like to get rid of them anywhere. I share them, you know, and if you get on my website, you'll see maybe six or eight or 10 stories that I've written. And right now I'm writing another book, I think. It feels, you know, like the same feeling I had in Dory's workshop, where uh, for five years, I felt, well, I didn't have a life after I was 17, you know, my teen years were it. That was where I was all jazzed up. And then I started thinking and writing some stories about my life since then. It was jazz, you know. We so, have another question here. For, I'm, I'm sorry, do you want to? I'm just saying I, I know how to submit. I just haven't really done it much. Yeah. Um, Julie Ackert, are you still in the audience? Mm -hmm. Yes, Julie. I request. You hi. You had a question I, for Steve. I did. I'm wondering, Steve. Well, first of all, wonderful. I love hearing your stories. I love hearing your 
telling your stories. It's just great. It's also wonderful. So my question is, was there any rewriting uh, required between self-publishing and Skyhorse publishing your book? Hmm. Uh, none. And I mean, I didn't go back on my own to redo anything. And they certainly let me go with everything I gave them straight from Amazon, except for the 50 comments, <laughs> something like that. Uh, no rewording. There was one fact check that I was um, tempted to prove to them that their fact checking was wrong. That was it. And it came out that they were wrong and they admitted it. But other than very minor, no, no major rewrites at all. They got back to me and back and forth to like four times with editing. Uh, and the editing was just like I said, in the margins, some uh, punctuation and th them commenting to themselves. You could see the editors talking, you know, to me, but more also themselves that to let me know, you know, this is really bad grammar. <laughs> but we like it. <laughs> we, we, we get it and we don't want to change it. So can I just say, Steve, that lest anybody thinks that Steve just like, you know, that these stories just sprung fully formed onto the page and stayed that way. Like Steve did take um, the year long manuscript group. You took it once or did you take it twice? I can't once. But I gave you the whole. Shebang. And then you, and then you and I went through it a couple of times. And it, I think at one point you said that I kicked your ass. So <laughs> Uh, I mean, the stories, when they first came down on the page in the groups, you know, they had a lot of the components of your of your book, but they were rough. And I, I just want people to know that, like, Steve worked his butt off rewriting the, this. It didn't just sort of, like, otherwise people might just go and jump in front of a train. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, like, like my story tells you, from what I could gather, even from my story, it's... it's um maybe a Cinderfella story, you know, it, it, things fell into my lap in a but way. You worked but, really hard too. But I did really work hard. And there were people who worked hard for me and with me. And I read Stephen King's book called On Writing. And I took so much from that where he said, you have, you want to write a book, you have to have a favorite reader or two or three. And, you know, thank God I do. People who really know me better than anybody and didn't cut me any slack. So no rewrites after that because I had such fabulous editors, favorite readers, but nothing between, say, Amazon and Skyhorse. It was a... That was that. Anne Teschner, did you want to ask Steve your question? Hi, Anne. Or is that more of a comment? Oh, gosh, sorry. Doing laundry and listening. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think I'm such a big fan of Steve, uh, but I think that part of what's so compelling about what you've done here is really ask us all to question the concept of tribalism. Does it make sense? At what point do we, do we move more broadly beyond our tribe? And I, I feel like that's a lot of the story in the, on the Stoop, the Stoop mm -hmm. story. So you think so too, or is that just me projecting? <laughs> well, not, you know, no, not at all, Anne. Thank you so much. Um, it's an interesting way to frame, you know, who I am, how I am. I certainly don't go around thinking myself as writing as a writer who's going to write a story about this concept called tribalism. But that's what it is it, it, now that you're talking about it, because I had a life that pushed me, if I was to survive emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, if I was to survive, I had to push beyond those bounds of what my tribe, tribes were. And it, it really was about having the courage, but also when you read the book, you'll see a whole lot of good fortune I had with great mentors mm. who helped me bridge those gaps mm. of color, ethnicity, gender, even, you know, human to animal in that regard. But yeah, it, it is about 
questioning this whole concept of our separatism. It strikes me that a lot of the the narrator's like deepest connections in the story in that Bronx childhood were people from different ethnicities, different religions, different, you know, that the narrator almost is never hanging out with kids that are like him. Right? As much as I had to, because, you know, as a Jewish kid growing up, I wasn't a Jewish kid growing up. The other Jewish kids didn't have a raging, violent alcoholic to deal with. They're, they were usually taken care of uh, in so many different ways than, than my siblings and I were. And, um, it, you know, that particular tribal uh, experience of being child of a very, very sick and active alcoholic and a mother who just did the best to survive and help, help us the best she can. That's a tribe, too. And there's a lot of us out there. And what does that mean? Either we're going to sink or swim. And I didn't have any help as a kid to figure that out specifically. So whatever you know comes through in some of my writing, I believe, has to do with you know that innate, almost divine thing that's in each one of us that helps us get through. Because so many times people see, say, Steve, you have you help so many kids in jail. But how come you didn't go to jail with your life? Well, I have to attribute that to factors in a mystical sense, as well as, you know, pointing my finger at actual people who helped me in situations that helped me. But it's all part of the notion of tribalism. I, I love that your story invites that bigger inquiry. It's great. And very genuinely, not, you know, me, 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 but just genuine. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Great question. Um, we have time for one more. And I think Mary Jo, you wanted to say, share some thoughts about the book. Are you still in the audience? Yes. Yes. I, um, you know, I think in addition to being able to share the ways in which, um, Steve, you learned to, to write and, uh, Ex express yourself in that way, I, I think it's so important that we go to the heart of the matter, which is you, your life, and, and the courage that you showed from a very, very early age. I mean, you were a child and you stood up to terrible, terrible situations and terrible people who were destroying the folks around you, destroying your sister, destroying your brother, destroying your mother, destroying your friends, uh, black friends and so forth. And you stood up, I mean, the courage that you exhibited practically from birth. Um, I mean, this is a story of a great human being. This is a story of a courageous human being. This is a story of somebody who can reach out beyond his own small self-defenses and build community with anybody, anybody, but especially with people who haven't had that, the, the opportunities, haven't had the chances, haven't had the money, haven't had the privilege, haven't had any goddamn thing. And I, I just think it's so important with all of the talk about writing and how we do it and how we publish. And most people never do get published who are very, very good writers. It's about the human being, especially in this case. And, you know, I just have to say, I, am, I read the book twice. I underlined practically every sentence. I starred and checked and, you know, wrote in my journal and did this and that. Because you don't meet too many Steve Bernsteins in, in, in life. You know, you really don't. And this person should be held up as just a magnificent human being and gives and gives and gives and gives in the face of complete power against, in the face of conventionality, which is stupid and superficial. 
Um, and I just, I just want to honor the humanity of Steve. Um, and that book, I mean, nobody could read that book and not be changed by it. Um, so, you know, I just, I needed to say that today and I uh, really appreciate you, Steve, and <clears throat> want to thank you for everything you've done in your entire life. <laughs> I don't know how any human being could be as courageous as you. So uh, thank you so much. Do you see me blushing over here? <laughs> I just want to say this woman, Mary Jo Hetzel, was one of my mentors. I think it's, I graduated from Springfield College of Human Services in 1994. Uh, and she stuck with me in my head and my mind. You were in one of those encouragers. You were one of those models for me in my adult life. It was right after leaving your program that I started a teen center and really started digging in to, you know, I had to do plumbing for a long time, but plumbing also became a laboratory and a platform for me to help kids by giving them jobs and teaching them trades. But Mary Jo, I, you know, I reached out to you recently and I'll tell you what, I meant every word I said, thank you for being you and expressing through teaching, through sharing uh, about the issues, the social issues. I was just a guy out there, just angry, wanting to change the world. And your program was the first time I forayed into academia mm -hmm. since my trade school days, <laughs> you know? and. Uh, you you were you were certainly my my model and my mentor throughout that process. So thank you. And thank you for all your kind words. I I hope this is recorded because I want to go back and listen to this stuff. Yeah. It also strikes me, Steve, when you say, like, oh, I just it fell on my lap. It just was handed to me. You say that about a lot of things when in fact, you know, you you have worked really hard and struggled really hard, you know, not just as a writer, but to overcome a lot of obstacles in life. And it just, it, it kind of shows me that there's a lot of power in how we frame things, you know, like you just choose not to focus on the struggles and on the, you know, and, and to say, and to look at the gifts. And I think that's, um, that's a really great lesson too, uh, to, to, for those of us, you know, who think this looks like it's been too easy for you or so like it had, you know, I know that it hasn't. And so there's a lot of power in looking at things through that lens of gratitude. And, and, and that's really fabulous. So um, we're out of time, but do you want to add anything here at the end, Steve? Well, you, you just touched on it, Dory, you know, um, Early on, I was handed a life that I had a couple choices. As a kid, you know, you don't think that big. You don't think that broadly. But I always knew very early, before the, the stories in this book, I always knew because I learned firsthand that when I help other people, when I even reach out to non-humans, I feel great. I feel good. And that's all I took as a, a personal philosophy for, for my whole life. So when I maybe appear, you know, uh, it fell on my lap, it was easy. No, I don't mean it exactly like that. What I do mean is uh, the philosophy, the spiritual practice, for lack of a better word, of helping others is the best kept secret in the world, sadly, because that's what makes me happy and gives me joy. And it's very selfish, hmm. selfish in a good way. It's very selfish. This book talks about that. Oh, we need more of that kind of selfishness. So here, here. Well, I, I think, you know, part of what I learned with you and in writing and, and with writers in general is that phrase, show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. Well, I do it in my life because we have way too many words. Mm -hmm. But if I could tell stories, or if I could just 
reach out at a, at a very, very pivotal moment in somebody's life and just do the right thing, say the right thing. Mm -hmm. It don't get any better than that. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, sincerely. This is, and thank you to all of you. Um, this is, as uh, someone just wrote in the chat bar, inspired community. It's so, it's such an honor to be part of your process, Steve, and to be part of a community that um, feels so mutually supportive. So thank, thanks to everybody who came today. And you can get Steve's book, um, anywhere pretty much <laughs> they're selling it at target and costco and you know yeah, but you can also order it at your local bookstore so if you want to support those folks and um and if you want to check out workshops at writers in progress we have a couple of great weekly workshops coming up um starting next week one with emily lackey who, which um is a writer's round table for people who want to turn in pages and get feedback from one another uh, and another one with Sivia Gover on the art of keeping a notebook and, and sustaining a writing practice. So check it out. And Steve, um, somebody asked when you're going to start teaching workshops. So we'll have to, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> Talk to Dory. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. They might, they might last 15, 20 minutes, but you know, <laughs> it'll be fun. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Um, it's a great achievement. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Enjoy Lovely. your evening, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations, Steve. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Congrats. Congratulations, Steve. Wow. Wow. Great job, Steve. It's an honor hearing the conversation and being part of this whole process of you um just engaging the world with your voice thank you so much i'm moved you know it wasn't a in-person uh mm. event with um <laughs> with wine and cheese but like it felt just as it felt just as supportive and celebratory and festive to me absolutely uh, I'm going to go 